All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Francisco Veloso. I'm the, the Dean of uh, Imperial College Business School, and, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here for um, uh, one of more of our inaugural lectures. Um, this one, uh, you know, where we're going to have Professor Mauricio Zolo, which I will introduce in a second. But before doing that, just the customary, uh, you know, uh, safety procedures. I mean, we're not expecting any fire alarm tonight, but um, if we, so if you hear something, it's because it's probably something that we should, you know, take seriously. And there are labs around the, the building, so that it hap sometimes happens from time to time. And so the exits, emergency exits, as you see, are, you know, this, this side and also on the back. And then you would, you know, follow indications to assemble um, outside. And so just um, uh, uh, with that out of the way, we can come back to, uh, you know, the topic <coughs> of uh, tonight, which is to introduce um, our guests and our uh, lecturer tonight. Um, and so Mauricio has been with us uh, for less than a year and is now the head of departments for management and entrepreneurship at the business school and also um, the, uh, you know, basic director of our Leonardo Center, which he will talk a little bit more uh, in detail. But, and his research from a long time has been looking at how organizations learn, right? How do they change? How do they evolve? But in an active way, so how can managers make decisions and influence, you know, the way that those organizations evolve and the way that they learn? What's possible to learn and not possible to learn? Uh, when do they learn and not learn? And this has been a topic that has been part of his academic career for, for, a, long, for a long time. And he's been you know, looking at this in particular in the context of complex situations, those complex organizations. So for example, mergers and acquisitions or alliances, or more recently in the context of sustainability and sustainable strategies, right? So these are all quite complex situations, environments with multiple stakeholders, multiple path, multiple, multiple directions, and thinking about what are the strategic actions that you can make you know, to basically influence the direction that the firm will go. Now, before coming back to where we are now, let me walk you back for a little bit for his career. And so he was trained as a monetary econ economist at Bocconi University, um, a native from Italy. Um, and then when he finished that, he went into industry. So he started working at Merrill Lynch in investment banking, where he stayed for a few years and did a set of interesting uh, uh, activities um, over, over that. Uh, and then he moved into consulting and worked at McKinsey for a few years as well. And it was at McKinsey that he started to develop this appreciation for learning and for how organizations learn. Of course, as you know, the work that management consultancy firms do to try to help organizations change and understand areas and directions that they can improve, it's a very interesting ground to learn that. But I think the motivation was to take it to a different level and to really engage on this in an academic, at academic, um, uh, with an academic lenses to really try to you know dig deeper and try to understand the learning journeys in a in a in a deeper and more profound way. And so to do that, he engaged in a PhD at Wharton, in University of Pennsylvania, where we worked uh, among others with uh, Sid Winter. You know one. Uh, uh, very important scholar, you know, historically in the area of um, uh, both innovation as well as, as strategy. And, um, you know, he did a very successful um, uh, doctoral thesis there that uh, won, you know, the outstanding dissertation award from the Academy of Management, which for those that don't know is the kind of leading academic society for this, uh, for this area. Um, and that, you know, is uh, a tribute to, you know, the you know, early impact that, that Mauricio has had in the profession from the, from the early years. In fact, um, you, know, you know, and the work was precisely looking at, you know, learning curves and when do you learn or not learn in mergers and acquisitions, which came from something that combined both his experience at McKinsey uh, as well as the work that he had done earlier on in investment banking, you know, then joining that up with an academic lenses in one of the leading international institutions. And in fact, you know, the lead article from his 
from his thesis, you know, gathered since today about 8,000 citations, which tells something about, you know, how influential, you know, the groundwork that he did do his, during his dissertation has been, you know, to the profession, um, and how important it has been, you know, him as a scholar in, 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 placing, this, in placing this field. So from that, he moved back into Europe, in, in Sead in particular, where he was an assistant and associate uh, uh, professor for, uh, you know, almost, uh, almost uh, 10 years. And there is also when he started to get much more uh, involved in the area of corporate sustainability uh, and looking at these issues that starting to then, you know, take a much more important uh, role in his research and he, in his, uh, and his career. And uh, in particular, he, was, he, he directed what was the largest EU-funded project on, on CSR at that time and the first kind of experiments on the development of a sustainability mindset in managers. How do you work this through to, to, to try to get managers to be much more mindful and much more involved in sustainability? Then he went back to his alma mater at Bocconi, um, where um, uh, he created, uh, uh, you know, basically a very large uh, uh, team of collaborations across the world, over 60 universities and 150 scholars around basically a team that's called, or a, 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 a network that's called Golden, um, that basically is looking at the evolution of companies, and in particular, how we can have a much more stakeholder-oriented, um, you know, uh, firm that really pays attention not just to shareholders, but to stakeholders, which we will hear much more about uh, later um, as, he, as he goes uh, through. And then he joined, as I said, um, Imperial College Business School less than a year ago. You know, overall, over his career, you know, he has over 16,000 citations, over 50 publications, many of them in the top journals in the profession. He's been very involved in the profession as well in terms of leading in some of the uh, uh, most important academies um, uh, for the area of management, both the Academy of Management and Strategic Management Society in particular. He's been in editorial boards on some of the leading journal uh, uh, as well. And so through all this involvement, he's certainly you know, one of the leading uh, international figures in the area of strategy, and in particular, um, um, you know, in something that now is connected much more to sustainability uh, over the last uh, over the last few few years, is also a music aficionado, um, you know, and has played guitar since ten, um, and uh, plays meditation or has uh, you know does meditation for over twenty five uh, year, and is also a very important. Uh, you know, symbol of how if we create a right inclusive environment for people that have some kind of limitation of disability to thrive because, you know, what you may not be aware is that Mauricio has over close to 90% limitation on his sight. And so, you know, it tells how important it is to create the right conditions for people to really thrive in their, in their environments if they have the right quality. And certainly is also, you know, a very important example uh, of, um, of that. And so he, he joined the, the business school less than a year, created Leonardo, became the head of the department for management and, and entrepreneurship. And, uh, and he's going to basically talk about uh, you know, his work, uh, not generally, but in particular in terms of sustainability, as we see, you know, how can business evolve from causes to remedy of social maladies? It's the, 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 the theme of today's inaugural lecture. And he's walking, um, you know, is going to walk us through that in terms of how can we really work towards this more stakeholder value creation um, approach? And what are the kind of academic tools that you can put in place to help us better understand it? and helps shape the direction that firms can go to really try to have this much more stakeholder approach into the way they, uh, they do things and into the way that we think about capitalism. And it's actually, it wasn't planned that way, but this is the week that they're supposed to be in Davos discussing this. So it's actually a, uh, a, a very good week. What? This will be better. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, but that's precisely that, you know, uh, but it's certainly something that's important and that we all care about. And that's why we're very much uh, delighted to have uh, Maurice Inodas joining the business school in Imperial College, but here today, you know, presenting and sharing with us his views. It's been a pleasure working with you, and I'm delighted to not only be introducing you, but to have you join us here at the business school and uh, the rest of Imperial College. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Francisco.
Well, what can I say after an introduction like this? Um, uh, the best thing I can do is to try to uh, uh, at least not disappoint you in <laughs> meeting expectations as high as the one that uh, Francisco has set up is obviously a challenge. I am really, uh, um, really honored uh, to be here. And, and this is not uh, the usual uh, statement. I really am. Um, for those of you uh, both here in the room and who are uh, with us you know, through the social media, we have both Facebook and, and YouTube, I'm told, uh, for the first time here at Imperial Connected. Um, it's really uh, a special treat for us as academics to be able to not only share our ideas with you know, students and colleagues, which is something that we are obviously well used to do, and it's always beautiful to do that, but also to, you know, with everyone else who's interested <laughs> in uh, hearing uh, about our ideas, and I think I would add to this, hearing about our own uh, convictions, our own passions. And uh, this is what will um, hopefully transpire uh, during my talk. What I, uh, the way that I framed the challenge, at least for this particular inaugural, is to obviously give you a sense of what I've been trying to do and some of my uh, scientific convictions. But more importantly is to give you a sense of how I am uh, envisioning the uh, way forward uh, towards addressing the uh, um, social maladies, as I mentioned in the title, through uh, essentially the uh, redefinition and the transition, the evolutionary transition of the role of business in society. Uh, it's a high, it's a very tall order, um, and as I will see, it requires uh, efforts not only from us as academics, but from all the various societal actors, uh, businesses, of course, governments, and so on. Um, but it is something that I think today, and I hope I'll be able to convince you, we actually are starting to see uh, the possibility to actually uh, make this happen. And this is actually, I would like to end uh, with a positive <laughs> note, even though the beginning is not going to be particularly pleasant. Um, you pick uh, which one of these figures uh, get you more ashamed, angry, uh, even fearful, right? Whether it is the fact that we're living in a world where more than half of the people are um, living below poverty line, where 36 million people, human beings, uh, die of starvation. Um, that's more than half of the population in the UK uh, every year. Um, or if you prefer the fact that we're living in a world where 16 people have the wealth equivalent to the total wealth of three and a half billion people. Right? I think the, the one statistic that I recently learned um, that comes from a, a research center, a pretty well reputed research center on bi marine biology, uh, that basically says, you know, came up with a report saying that by 2050, if we go at this rate, we'll have, uh, in terms of weight, more plastic in the ocean than fishes. Um, I mean, you pick. The problem, obviously, is how do we actually tackle all of this, right? We are living in a, in a, in a really important historical moment, though, where humanity, for the first time, has actually converged, at least, in framing the problems, coming up not only with uh, the problems, but with targets, clear targets, and the governments of all the entire world, all the governments in the world, have committed to achieve those targets. We should not underestimate. That's never happened. It's the first time, and it is hugely important. Of course, it's only one step. What does it take in order for those commitments to actually be uh, delivered on, right? 
<laughs> well, it takes a whole village, as they say. It's, it's the whole societal uh, actors, all the societal actors. Governments alone have no chance, no hope. I think this is very clear for everyone. There's no way that governments can deliver by themselves uh, on all those commitments that they have taken in 2015, uh, unless and until they figure out a way to stimulate fundamental behavioral change in all the other actors. And, and of course, the other actors are, uh, have to do fundamentally with the private sector. And I will be focusing on uh, corporations, but obviously there are there is plenty of other uh, actors. And I will come back at the end to the role of academia, which is another important actor, of course, uh, in the whole drama. Okay? So, Let's think about the role of business. And again, depending on how you see this, whether you prefer to look at the uh, empty half of the glass or the full half of the glass, uh, there are really bad news or sufficiently positive news, okay? Um, put it that way. Um, so the bad news, of course, is that uh, most actually if you want to be honest, pretty much all the challenges, all the social maladies are either directly or indirectly the consequence of business activity. Okay? And I'm just giving you some examples here. You know, 40% of US population is obese, um, and 40% of the working population is actually under severe forms of stress. Um, that's just some examples. Of course, I'm not going to talk about the, the environmental impacts, which we have already seen, and we know those are kind of very visible in a way. Uh, but there are many other, particularly the social maladies, for which, um, for which you know, the impact of business uh, activities are a lot less uh, obvious to the broader population. Now, at the same time, though, we are talking about what is considered, arguably, the most powerful actor in today's society, okay? Even more than governments, to some extent. Uh, you know, not only because they're big, right? Uh, you know, 54 of the largest economies are not states, are companies. You know, if you take the 1,000 largest companies in the world, they account for 70% of the whole gross national problem. Basically, they, they create 70% of the uh, uh, wealth, uh, in a way, huh? production-wise. So it's very concentrated as well. So in theory, this is actually good news, right? Because if you get 1,000 leaders, men and women, in a, maybe in a room a bit bigger than this, let's say, you know, a thousand seats, and you lock them in <laughs> and kind of, so you got to figure out a way to change fundamentally the way that you're doing things. Uh, just kidding, of course. But the, uh, but the point is, it wouldn't necessarily uh, undertake um, that kind of miraculous treatment. We don't need magic wands if we can actually figure out a way to help companies understand how they can transition towards a way to run their business that actually creates not only economic but also uh, non-economic value, first of all, and it creates value for uh, a more uh, diffused, right? Uh, population of stakeholders. In a way, it is the challenge that economic science has always had, right? To move beyond economic value logic, right? So non-economic, and at the same time to think about distribution of value, not only production of that. And here is where essentially the, uh, the uh, uh, if you want, the solution uh, to this uh, <laughs> existential uh, set of problems uh, could come, right? Essentially linking 
uh, all these social maladies that can actually pretty easily be linked to all the various functions of the firm and the various activities that are necessary in order to um, you know, conduct uh, business activity. The operations are pretty straightforward. For example, all the environmental impact challenge, they would influence clearly the, uh, the operations, the supply chain, the uh, uh, new product development, or at least they could influence it in a positive way. Um, the uh, uh, human side of the uh, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, the diversity issue, the equality issues, the uh, human uh, workplace uh, issues obviously connect to the uh, uh, talent management, to the way that uh, uh, companies select, train, motivate, um, and develop uh, human resources, talent, and so on, right? I could go on, but essentially the, the message is very clear, right? If we uh, understand, and more importantly, they, I mean, companies uh, understand how to adjust all the various pieces, the core pieces of what they're doing uh, to accommodate and create, to learn how to create value for their stakeholders, then you know, some of those uh, challenges, at least they can be uh, uh, addressed. Um, now, a bit more specifically, uh, the fundamental challenge here, I would like you to understand the complexity of the challenge, first of all, before we talk about how do we, uh, how are we getting organized um, in academia, and more importantly here, uh, even more specifically at, at Imperia College, in order to, to, to tackle this challenge. So think about the purpose, why firms exist, right? It needs to be redefined. Redefined in terms of uh, creation of value, not just economic value, also well-being, social, human value, uh, for employees, customers, suppliers, and communities, as well as um, investors. So essentially, all the investors of the critical forms of capital that are necessary for any firms to exist, let alone, obviously, for any firm to thrive and be successful. Okay? There is no firm that can exist without uh, being able to use very well the skills and capabilities of their employees, the relationship uh, that he has with uh, the external world, right? the social capital, and more importantly, the natural capital, right? which is owned by the communities. Right? Communities are critical not only because they give and can get back potentially the uh, license to operate, but because they own the natural capital that is given to companies in expectation for their capacity to create value for the community. And it's this give and take that is not been working well, fundamentally, at the purpose level, right? The way that we currently define why firms exist. That has implication for the governance, right? How companies should be governed if the idea is to create, open up, essentially, the castle, right, and allow uh, other stakeholders to come in, right? Govern the board of directors, for instance, could be uh, created uh, with representatives of all the stakeholders, right? Customers, suppliers, local communities, employees, and so on. Strategic decision making can be made with re the rele relevant stakeholder represented, right? In the in the process of of making those decisions, right? These are the fundamental decisions for allocating strategic resources. And you know, they're usually, they're always done, made without the relevant stakeholders being part of the decision, right? It's, you know, sometimes they're at least listened to before, right? But the decision process is made without them. And then, of course, I can go ahead, you know, with the, the way that uh, culture, where the leadership processes are developed, right? Again, with the mindset, uh, we'll see some studies afterwards that tell you this is the real, really, really difficult thing, right? How to change the, the soft aspect of any company, right? The leadership models and the, and the culture. 
and I'm not going to bore you uh, with the details, but you can see how uh, a company, a, a logic of stakeholder value creation would essentially require pretty much every function and every activity, every element of the system to be reconsidered, redesigned. Right? Now, just to be very clear, we don't know. I have yet seen, had to see a company that has started from the standard model and have accomplished the evolutionary process that is necessary in order to do all of this. Okay? We have only started to see companies that are serious about making some of these changes, certainly not all of them. Uh, and not all of them in a profound way. Why? Because essentially the solution really requires the heart <laughs> of the uh, uh, animal <laughs> to be uh, changed, right? And you know, the heart is, has to do with the way that it considers itself, with the way that, that value is considered, for instance, economic and non-economic, the same importance, the way that uh, you know, value for whom that's a big, big uh, uh, shift in the mindset. And we cannot expect companies, for instance, to uh, uh, realize their role in uh, reaching you know, the systemic change that we need, right? which is at the end of this evolution, unless and until they have started with the more simple steps. Right? It's, it's a cognitive and, to some extent, emotional and identity uh, evolution. And that's why this is definitely cannot be done overnight. Now, the good news is that the financial markets actually are showing, have been showing for quite some time now, uh, implicitly and even more explicitly now with uh, not only the CEO of uh, BlackRock. BlackRock is the largest uh, investor in the world, almost $7 trillion under management. Um, who has been stimulating the CEO. Remember the 1,000 people that we want to lock in the room? He's been sending letters every January to all of them, okay? Sending letters. Well, you know, if you and I send letters to the CEOs of the 1,000 largest companies, we can do that, but nothing is going to change, right? But if you manage $7 trillion and you have investment in each and every one of them, or most of them, the vast majority of them, then they're going to listen. Yeah? Yeah? So that's a very important signal. The other signal is the fact that managers are now starting to really understand at least the problem and what they need to be doing. This is a a survey by A.T. Kearney uh, that of, of managers in uh, top lar large firms, and the questions really identify what they see, not only the challenge, but also the complexity in dealing with the challenge. As I was saying before, the hardest uh, problems are the soft, <laughs> are the soft aspects, changing the uh, culture, changing the mindset of leaders, changing the way that strategic decision making is made. Okay? That's the real issue. It's not going to be solved overnight, but at least there is an awareness that that's what needs to be done. That's what they're discussing this week in Davos. Right? They didn't discuss it 10 years ago. Right? The whole concept of a stakeholder capitalism is at the heart of the conversation this week. Right? It's not just climate change. Right? And that's really important and, and to some extent new and encouraging. Now, what are we trying to do here at uh, Imperial? And you know, thanks again to Francisco for, for the very kind introduction. Um, in our little uh, uh, world, we're trying to create essentially a platform for uh, engaging companies and other societal actors in the uh, exploration and experimentation necessary in order to uh, not only study, but as, again, Francisco was saying, 
you know, part of my passion is to combine the study, understanding the, the reality, of particularly this evolutionary change, with also having an influence and trying to facilitate and speed up, right, make these changes as uh, effective as possible and obviously as rapidly diffused as possible. And so what the uh, center builds on is uh, an inviolable initial uh, data set that I will say a few more things about, has new methodologies that, again, I'll say a few things about, and obviously, uh, you know, a network of competences and collaborations, not only across all the other research centers in, in relevant, obviously, to this question here at Imperial, but also uh, more broadly. The data is um, utilized, is ready, we started to, to use it to create the basis for uh, assessing where companies uh, are along their capacity to create value, joint value for the shareholders as well as for their stakeholders, but also to understand where the frontier is and how the frontier companies are evolving, right? How, because this is a very rapidly evolving uh, uh, process that is fascinating to study, but also very important to, to uh, uh, influence, to be part of. And that data base, that evidence, is the basis for experimental, field experiments, not lab. This is experiments with the companies, helping them to see what happens when they change, maybe in some subsidiaries, the governance system or the incentive systems or whatever, right? The uh, HR selection processes. And now, the impact, of course, we hope we'll be able to make the scientific impact that any research center wants to make, but at the same time, we're hoping to also have an impact on how uh, businesses and all the other stakeholders uh, around businesses will evolve in their practice. This is kind of a snapshot on the uh, data set. It's, uh, again, the uh, uh, consequence of the wide variety of and deep uh, uh, expertise uh, across campus. Um, so it's been uh, created uh, with the help of uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, NLP, uh, that read about 100,000 collected and read 100,000 uh, sustainability reports and extracted about 5 million uh, initiatives, uh, 13,000 companies over 12 years, and this is just the beginning. Eh? We're going to obviously expand it even more. And importantly, it also categorizes in terms of the uh, sustainable development goals that the initiatives aim to fulfill as well as the type of activities, right? Is it a training program? Is it a uh, you know, philanthropic donation or a change in process and so on? This is just to give you a sense of the data. These sustainability initiatives are growing exponentially, okay? So companies are getting more and more involved uh, in uh, this type of activity, uh, whether they realize or not what they're doing, that's a different question, meaning do they really understand the impacts of each and every one of those initiatives? Probably not, but it's important that they're trying, that they're really uh, starting to, to uh, um, invest uh, time and, and energy in doing that. Of course, the link between the behavior, so the data set is all about behavior, right? Corporate behavior, in trying to solve the problems, the societal problems that I was talking about before. The link between that behavior and the joint performance uh, outcomes, both the financial outcomes and the stakeholder you know, value creation is, a big, is the big question that we're trying to solve and we're trying to address, understanding essentially what are the type of activities that have more impact, that have more leverage, um, because they allow the company to create value for all its stakeholders. And where are the differences, obviously, between company X, uh, right, and the companies at the frontier? 
those that are obviously best at creating both type of uh, uh, value. We are developing a theory and testing, uh, a theory about the evolution, how companies learn right, uh, and change in the way that they think about the challenge, first of all. At the beginning, is entirely kind of driven by legitimacy, reputation. Uh, then it gets into more uh, efficiency-driven issues, right? If you pay less for the electricity bill or the materials and so on, obviously that reduces the uh, uh, costs. But more importantly, and the most advanced companies now are in the third quadrant, which has to do with actually revenue growth driven by uh, the development of uh, either environmental or socially impactful type of products. And that's the frontier, and it's great, right? That tells you that there's been already an evolution, that, that things are on the way. Is that enough? No, right? In the sense that you actually also need companies to make the last step, the changes that we are talking about <coughs> internally, going beyond the new product development, beyond the innovation uh, side. And just to give you uh, a, a snap, as, you know, a quick overview of the methodologies that we are developing based on that data, data set that I was talking about before. Um, you know, you can think about it almost as a portfolio approach. So every company can be analyzed um, on these two dimensions with all their sustainable uh, sustainability activities. This is a, a real company, it's an oil and gas sector. 1,800 initiatives over 12, over 12 years. That's, you know, 150 <laughs> initiatives per year, okay? Uh, and it's not the most active, by the way. So they're doing a lot of stuff. And it can be categorized along all the various sustainable development goals, as well as the type of activities, okay? And you can see where they're putting most of their attention, most of their... <laughs> Uh, energy and, and resources and so on and so forth. Now, at this point, this allows us to then uh, map the uh, uh, one company with all, versus all the others and particularly look at the, uh, those companies that can create, have a higher financial performance and a higher level of uh, uh, stakeholder appreciation and start looking at the differences in terms of the type of SDGs that they might, uh, that company X, for instance, need to invest less on and others that invest, need to invest more on. And within the same SDG, same social malady, what are the type of activities that seem to be more effective? For instance, they might be you know, uh, investing too little on training and too much on whatever communication, okay? Just to give you. And, more imp and the third uh, step here is, that's fantastic, but what is the actual effectiveness of a single initiative, right? So with this basis, you can actually imagine, obviously, that, that companies will be able to also start experimenting with new types of initiatives and look at what actually are the uh, consequences, right, for both shareholders and stakeholders. And we can provide not only a support, a platform, a neutral platform, for them to make those kind of experimentation in a rigorous way, right, scientifically designed field experiments, but also have collective learning processes where they can share. Imagine companies at the frontier that have done a lot of this stuff, right? They have gone through a learning curve, but they want to go to the next level, right? That, again, is another role for us as academics to provide that platform. And that's, this is not only important for individual companies, but also to study the evolution of entire uh, sectors, entire industries. And that becomes really fascinating because if you put it together within industry, first of all, you can compare and contrast different industries, best practices or, or ideas can come from different industries. You can look at, uh, you know, the, the uh, diffusion across industries, not just within industries of 
uh, these type of the best and the most effective initiatives. But also from a policy perspective, it becomes interesting because clearly uh, industry associations as well as governments, local governments, national governments, international institutions are interested in understanding what they could do in order to facilitate the evolution of sectors from negative externalities, both environmental and social, to positive right? uh, social impacts and maybe regenerative environmental uh, impacts. That is, again, the, uh, uh, for us as academics, is, gives us the opportunity to design, if you want, the type of experiments similar to what uh, at MIT uh, Duflo and, and uh, her uh, colleagues who won the Nobel Prize last year have done directly with uh, experiments on, on social maladies, right, like malaria, we can do it through the uh, influence of the corporate behavior. Right? So it's a different type of experiments, equally important. Now, we're not going to be doing this alone. As uh, we were saying, there is, there is a, a need, a fundamental need of cross-disciplinary competence that fortunately here at Imperial College we have in abundance, but that is not enough, right? And, and what we're doing is working with a, a, a whole network of uh, uh, research centers and institutes, I have found, and I must really congratulate Imperial College on this, uh, of all the academic institutions I've been uh, throughout my academic career, this is the one that by far has the strongest uh, culture of collaboration and sharing. Uh, and that to me is a really strong and powerful you know, prerequisite to crack these problems. It's way uh, more important than having uh, a powerful global, global network. And this is where I wanted to uh, leave you today um, with the message that yes, we are facing some of the most difficult challenges uh, that humanity has seen. Um, there have been improvements, but certainly uh, the one element that we are starting to see uh, that can be uh, leveraged in order to create at least a part of the solution to the big, uh, to the big uh, question about societal maladies, about sustainable development, has to do with the creation of, of uh, a new form of business, right? The stakeholder-centered could be a way uh, to uh, uh, see this new form of a sustainable society to emerge. Um, this is what I am committed uh, to do, obviously, to study and to eventually uh, participate, contribute uh, to emerge. And I trust that uh, hopefully you all at least have uh, seen that you know, this is something that is possible, but that it requires uh, the collaboration across all the various aspects, all the various actors. You know, academics, in first, obviously that's what we can do. Businesses, uh, institutions, governments, um, and local communities. You know, citizens like you and me also play a fundamental role in shaping uh, and, and helping, supporting companies that are serious about the, uh, doing this, right? We do that every time we uh, purchase uh, a product, right? Being willing to pay a little bit more for the product by the company that uh, has been doing this. Uh, we do this when we vote. We do this when we save and give our savings to the, uh, you know, Black Rocks, for instance. But you know, we'll see <laughs> uh, whether they <laughs> whether they actually <laughs> deliver uh, and so on. So. You know, in a way, it is at the beginning of a, uh, an imp a critical journey, but uh, I'm really positive. And uh, I would like to end here and really thank you uh, for the attention that you've given me and for the honor of your presence here uh, tonight. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for um, that um, wonderful presentation and, and sharing and inviting us all to contribute to, to this important change. I mean, the idea is now we open it up for questions. We're going to have, we have two microphones that are going to be circulating around. And these are important because, as Maurice, you noted, since we're streaming these, you know, if you don't talk to the microphone, people here may hear it, but people that are not here will not be able to hear it. So before you ask your question, do, do, do wait for the, for the microphone. So, all right, we have here a first question right here. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very informative and uh, optimistic presentation as well. Can I ask you, Professor Zollo, your views on the impact of um, statements that come from the business world which say all the right things? For example, Mark Carney, the governor mm -hmm. of the Bank of England statement last year, and also the Business Roundtable in August of 2019, where they, the position statement on uh, stakeholder value versus shareholder value. Do you believe that these will have influence? And uh, I'd like your views, that would be very yes. interesting. Thank, Thank you. you, Thank you for that question. Um, we'll take it one by one, right, yes. uh, Chairman? Yes, I think for now, <laughs> yes. The, um, the uh, fact that the uh, uh, round table, business round table, for those of you who are not in the game, it's the uh, most powerful club of CEOs in the United States. Um, about 200 CEOs of the largest US companies that historically have been uh, the uh, pillar of the shareholder value maximization uh, paradigm. And up until August this 2019, they have maintained that position, that the, essentially what companies are all about is the creating shareholder value, and that's the uh, role and responsibility, for instance, of the boards and the, and the senior managers. In August, they have changed their mind, right? Flipped it to basically say that actually, no, we were wrong. The, uh, the role of the corporation is pretty much in line you know, with the, what I was talking about before, a stakeholder value creation logic, and it's, you know, again, if you like the uh, uh, full side of the glass, it's a great signal, right? Yeah, uh, of course, there is the empty side of the glass which says, it's nice to say it, show me uh, that you actually are really committed to do it. And that's what we're waiting for, right? We can't just accept um, promises and commitment and important. Commitments are important, but they're not enough. All right, thank you. Other question? Yes, back there. Hi there, yeah. Um, what do you think, is there any point or anything that the governments can do to promote better behavior? Hmm. Well, the, the, as I was saying, the role of the government is, uh, is essential. Um, you know, expecting that the government is going to be able to regulate this transformational change, I think is um, not uh, really the, the uh, most um, uh, obvious way to, uh, to think about their role. What the governments uh, are responsible for is to uh, inform and obviously try to create the condition for this uh, transformational change to happen through a series of incentives, positive and negative incentives. For instance, they can make for the best, for the companies at the frontier, uh, governments can make their life uh, easier in a way by providing them access to you know, easier access to credit or, you know, giving them uh, even access to uh, public procurement, for instance. There are a lot of things that can be done. Obviously, lower taxes could be another uh, even more, but more expensive solution, obviously. Uh, but that's the way that I see it. It's a question of uh, creating the appropriate incentive system for the private sector to make the appropriate investments and, and uh, proceed on this evolutionary path. 
Of course, governments also have the same problems internally. Yeah? They also need to uh, adapt the way that they're, they make you know, strategic decision decisions and governance uh, processes, transparency, integration of their stakeholders in the governance and so on, right? It's the same problem. Even academia has, we also have the same problem, right? making those fundamental changes uh, in the way that we work. Um, so everyone has its own internal homework to make, but governments can also play a critical role in changing incentive systems so that companies can evolve. Okay, maybe we'll take a couple of questions, so one there and then here so that well, one, two, three, we'll take three questions and then... Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Could I ask whether you see the um, uh, getting a greater, a higher success rate or, or a greater take-up uh, by businesses if you try to link these goals with the, the basic economic goals of the, of the company? And I'm taking you to your circle chart and ask you whether, in fact, you could not join the circle and actually get a virtual... Uh, uh, improvement because yes. this w the sustainable uh, benefits to society can then actually reinforce the company's pr own performance and therefore you get a virtual circle on, right. on, on the, uh, the company. So the, then let's get another because yeah. we have mm -hmm. several answers. Another one and then we'll take this. Right there, there was a hand up somewhere there. Right, yeah, there. Professors, hello. Yes. Professor Zolo, thank you for um, this fantastic presentation. Um, my question was, you showed a graph where you showed the environmental impact and the social impact um, of companies in, in different sectors. And I was wondering, we, we've seen companies, uh, finance services, we've seen the health sector. I was wondering if you, if you have any ideas of sectors which have positive both social and environmental impacts? or. <laughs> directions where, you know, a sector we could look to uh, which is closest to that quadrant. The plus plus. The, the plus plus, yes. Let's Thank get you. A third question here. I don't know if you could. These are excellent questions, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I have no idea if you can remember them all, but um, <laughs> thank you very much. Brilliant presentation. Uh, I think I'd take a photograph of every slide you put up. That's fantastic. Um, my question is around the broad notion that this conversation we're having is one that's been happening for a long time. Uh, the goals that have been set up, set up by the UN 2030, that's quite soon. Uh, we are, I don't know if you've come across the work of the British Academy mm -hmm. that have done a lot of work in this space and I love it all, but I'm off, often left sort of thinking, right, that's a lot of stuff to do. So my area of interest it is, you know, you need to look at governance, ownership, investment, policy. What I'm really interested in are what are the two or three things that you think are getting in the way and actually the real areas that are going to create a shift because we're in a time of urgency and things are just not moving at the pace that we really need. So there are two or three things that you'd really see in this whole system that could make a difference. I'd love to know what that is. Thank you. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting set of questions. So um, on the uh, uh, question about the uh, social and, um, and financial impacts, um, totally agree the uh, interdependence between the two forms of performance is clearly there and positive, right? We have all the right now. We used to think that it was a trade-off, right? That either you create value for shareholders or you create value for stakeholders. Now the evidence shows very clearly that that is not the case. I've shown you that graph you know, by BlackRock that replicates the studies of uh, a lot of other academics, uh, colleagues, that are showing that even starting from the same initial condition with the same financial performance, uh, companies that, that invest more are actually rewarded, and so there is a positive. But that's precisely why we're looking at the, uh, if you want, the performance on those two dimensions, right? So we want to identify the 
behavior that impacts, that maximizes both financial and financial performance and stakeholder uh, appreciation, right? Stakeholder uh, value creation. And to, uh, for us, that, that's a, uh, you know, a, not only a, a, an academic uh, research question that is important, because we don't have a good answer to that, uh, but also it's a very important you know, managerial question, obviously. Now, um, you know, help me with the second one, which obviously I forgot. Um, but I, I, I'm going to take the third one, um, which is the, the most challenging of all. Um, I think the, the one thing that we have made, we as not only academics, but I think even institutions, the one mistake that we have made is to essentially uh, stop at the, uh, st at the stage of developing guidelines, uh, developing um, concepts, ideas. And here is you know, the, the new way to think about what companies should do in order to be sustainable, in order to be creating value for stakeholders. And there's plenty of lists and, and, and guidance. Uh, what we, and, and I say academics as well as everybody and all the other and institutions, have not done is create the evidence, develop the evidence of uh, what happens when, when X is done rather than Y, maybe for the same goal. Right? We don't have the experimental evidence. Uh, and that's what, uh, uh, in my view, is missing, and that's what can drive not only the speed of change, but the direction, the quality of the direction of change. Because it could very well be, and in fact I expect, that most of the efforts, most of the resources, the energies that have been, that are and will be produced by companies in order to crack the problem, is going to be wasted. Okay? Uh, and it's going to slow down the progress, it's going to slow down societal uh, evolution towards sustainability. Whereas experimental evidence, if well done collaboratively, and by the way, there is a role for academia, there's a role for business, there's also for consultants as well, uh, right? So we probably know how to design good experiments. Consultants can help companies implement uh, those changes. And companies obviously will benefit from having a direct experience of what it means to manage in a sustainable way for stakeholders. Sustainability is an experience good. Right? You cannot see the value of the logic of stakeholder logic unless and until you actually have experienced it, have actually tried to run a company this way. That's what I've been hearing from many of the companies that are at the frontier. And I missed the second one. Can you quickly remind me? Oh, the industries. Right. We haven't done our homework yet, right? We have just begun to uh, uh, analyze this huge uh, data set. And we are starting to map industries one uh, after the other. But that's going to take a bit of time. So you will forgive me if I will kind of duck that question <laughs> professionally. <laughs> and, uh, you know. Uh, Last round of questions. There was a couple of hands here. I don't know if the microphones. Thank you, Maurizio. Um, I'm really, really happy to see this work coming into being at Imperial. Um, I'm normally a glass half full person on the innovation side, but I'm just still sobering up with your first slides on the SDGs. And actually, if you make some linkages, BlackRock and three other big investment houses control a lot of the finances in those top thousand companies. They hardly ever vote against the executives. Those companies are spending more lobbying government. Government's weak on antitrust laws. And then the chief exec of Boeing gets paid 80 million pounds to leave after killing a load of passengers when his plane crashes. That's hardly sustainable society. You are going to have to work really hard to get an insertion point in this. 
with some evidence, I think quite quickly to turn some of these stories around. And, and we need to help you do that. But I think it's going to be critical to do something quite quickly to put some beacons of hope out there from the lab. Um, you know, I don't want to wait for three years to hear what the results look like, yeah. is what I'm saying. So how are we going to do that together? You want me to answer right away? It's no, no, not it's a not question, not. it's a comment. Yeah, no. It's no. a comment. And I, uh, no, just three, three questions yeah. and then we'll open it up. Because so actually important. mine builds on what you were saying about the insertion point. Rizio, you and I have had conversations about uh, what it takes for a company to experiment. Companies don't like risk. They want the evidence, they want the data. You've got a lot of it. But I'm wondering, when we look at exponential shifts, that this, this is going to need one. We need that exponential shift. We need a tipping point. And I'm wondering what we can all count on, what we can all go for as a milestone. What would be the tipping point through experimentation, through the building of data, to insert and intervene in the system that's charging ahead with no regulation? Yeah. other than all of us having a say and putting our hands up, but it's not enough. So what's the intervention we can all make? What's the tipping point that won't take as much time? But <laughs> And how can we get people really willing, hold their hands to experiment? Yeah, I'm, I'm searching for the magic uh, rod. And <laughs> if, all right, I think we'll... Leave it Stay there. there. Um, so, so uh, well, thank you. These are... Uh, more, uh, you know, uh, precious comments and, and signals of how important uh, this work is. Um, my sense is that if uh, the uh, uh, companies that are at the frontier in the uh, frontier sectors, in the sectors that are most impactful, uh, and that includes financial services, retail, oil and gas, and so on, energy, uh, pharmaceutical, food. The frontier companies come together with the other actors, you know, including us, and uh, create um, a program of experimentation that will create, will develop, obviously, will generate the evidence of the uh, impacts of changes, fundamental changes at the core of the firm, that evidence is what has been missing so far in the discussion, right? It, the discussion so far has been made on the basis of ethical stands, you know, we need to do something about this. Not quite clear about what, but, you know, it's got to be changed, right? As you were saying, behaviors from the corporate world uh, has been you know, dramatically wrong in many, many uh, instances. But the problem is that to change that, we need evidence to show that by doing X rather than Y, you actually are able to create both financial value and stakeholder value. That's missing. And that is the one issue. It's valuable for the companies that are going to do the experiments, of course, but it's even more valuable for all the other companies that have not done the experiments, but they can leverage the insights from those experiments in order to design the appropriate integrated strategies. They have to put them together, what they do for stakeholders with what they do for regular growth and competitive advantage. That's what, ha that's what needs to happen, unless and until we have evidence of what really, really works across the board for all the stakeholders. We're not going to make real advancement. Well, thank you very much. Thank Mauricio. you. Thank you all. And uh, we're going to... So we're going to have some closing remarks. Uh, we have the, the pleasure and the honor to have John Allen uh, here with us. And John is the, the president of CBI and uh, the chairman of uh, both Tesco and, and Barrett Developments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, more importantly to us here is, you know, the, the chair um, of council, uh, of college council, um, you know, that, um, that is just, um, uh, you know, coming in 
you know, thank into you. That, that role. And so thank you very much for accepting our invitation to no, come. Well, look, look, it's a pleasure to be here. It's actually it's a privilege to be here. First of all, don't, I don't want anyone to think that I'm an expert on Imperial yet. I'm at the very early stage of trying to get up a very steep learning curve in understanding how this institution works and the contribution it can make. Um, but, you know, the issues we've been talking about tonight are really of fundamental importance. And I think that they, you know, we're not going to solve them in three weeks or three months or three years. You know, this is a journey that's going to take many years. But actually, I believe we have reached a tipping point. And for example, <clears throat> the pronouncement by the Business Roundtable in the US was incredibly significant because the US has been the bastion of the kind of shareholder value concept. The fact that they have now changed their view on that is, I think, incredibly important. Now, on top of all the things, the really valuable things that Mauricio talked about tonight, all of which have got a role to play, you know, I'd want to emphasize, I think, the, the importance of leadership in terms of doing things here. You know, I think we've actually got to encourage, and there will not always be predictable. You know, if you experiment, you don't know that things are necessarily going to be <clears throat> successful. Uh, you know, one of my other jobs is chairing Tesco, and Tesco has a lot of stakeholders. We're the largest, single largest private sector employer in the UK. We employ about 330,000 people. We're in over 3,000 communities, so, you know, we understand about the importance of communities. And, of course, what we do <clears throat> has a great deal of impact on, you know, the 11 million people who shop with us every week and, and so on and so on, and the huge number of suppliers who supply us and who you know, we can have an impact on as well. Now, what has changed us, I think, is sort of coming through a crisis where, in which the company had not performed well, not behaved well, um, and in a sense, we had the reverse of that graph that we saw. We saw, you know, poor behavior actually leading to poor performance. And new management, new leadership who said, look, you know, we've actually just got to get on and change our ways and do things differently uh, with the conviction that that was actually the right thing to do. You know, one of the things I'm blessed with as the chairman of two companies is two CEOs whose reaction to almost any set of events is not, you know, what's the kind of easy thing to do, the expedient thing to do, but what's the right thing to do. And I think we need, you know, business leaders who are prepared to do that. And it is changing. Look, I was a young, you know, youngish, never very young, CEO <laughs> 25 years ago. And I remember the following encounter as a really recently appointed CEO I went along to see quite a big institution, not as big as BlackRock, and I get Larry Fink's letters too, um, <clears throat> but you know, a fairly important shareholder to us. And they had been reading our annual report before I arrived, and they'd spotted that we had given 25,000 pounds to what we thought was a you know, rather worthwhile charity. And this is what the shareholder said to me, and these words are engraved on my soul for all time. It was, listen, sunshine, that was, the, that was the respectful way in which shareholders addressed company CEOs. Listen, sunshine, when we decide to give our money to charity, we'll let you know. Now, that was a real conversation 25 years ago. You know, at, I think the peak, you know, whatever it was, peak shareholder value in the UK. Um, things have changed. I think people now, there's a much better realization of the fact that you know, we operate in an environment in which there are lots of stakeholders, attitudes are changing, and now we get not just letters from Larry Fink, we get letters from Schroders telling us that you know, they have concluded that the companies that are the most environmentally sustainable are going to be better investments, and therefore there is a positive reason for doing this. Now, you know, is that actually scientifically proven at the moment? No, but I think it represents a strongly held conviction on their part, which is going to influence their behavior and you know we should respond to it now look being practical we are concerned at tesco about the amount of plastic that is used in our operations um, young people are particularly concerned about environmental issues they have a level of concern i think which is much higher than their their sort of olders and not betters um, uh, like you know many of the people in my age group so what we did a year ago is we took 22 of our graduates and we locked them away for a couple of weeks and we said come up with a series of practical proposals that allow us to reduce the amount of plastic we use in our business and first of all to eliminate plastics that are not recyclable uh, you know this is bad news for the kind of PVC industry and so on uh, but let's move into plastics that at least are potentially recyclable where can we eliminate 
plastics. You know, if you get home shopping from Tesco, you no longer get it in lots of little plastic bags. Um, uh, as tomorrow, we will announce that we are eliminating the shrink wrapping of multi cans of things like soup and beans. At the moment, if you go into a supermarket, you can buy four cans of beans at a small discount to a single can of beans, and it's sort of shrink wrapped, and that involves quite a lot of plastic. From the 1st of March, that will not be possible in Tesco. And that will save 600 tons of plastic a year. Um, and frankly, it will cost us sales because some people pick up four cans of beans because it's kind of, or soup because it's kind of handy to, or tuna or whatever it is, it's handy to do that. They probably will buy smaller amounts, hopefully more frequently. But I think the view we've taken is it's the right thing to do. And if it costs us a bit of sales in the short term, so be it you know, in order for us to be, you know, better corporate citizens and to be seen to being more responsive about what's right for the environments in which we operate. So I think in the long run, the chart that Mauricio showed us, which is that, you know, companies that behave properly should do better, is absolutely right. In the short run, it may not be. And I think we've been having a debate internally at the moment about do we tell the market that this, ac this action we're going to announce on Thursday is going to cost us sales or not? Do we panic them into thinking it's going to be a much higher, because the impact of its negative will be, frankly, pretty modest. So I think that companies are waking up, and not just Tesco, but many of the other business people I talked to, to a recognition that there are issues that need to be addressed. Business can and should and must play a part in addressing those issues. Business's reputation, particularly in the developed world, it's very interesting, there are differences in view. In the developing world, business is still seen, I think, in many cases, as being a rather positive uh, thing, which is making a difference, you know. And good things are happening. You know, hundreds of millions of people are being pulled out of property, uh, out of poverty around the world. Infant mortality is falling. You know, so it's not all a black picture, but that doesn't in any way undercut the fact there are still these huge issues that need to be addressed. In the developed world, I think pretty much across the developed world, business has got a poor reputation and frankly needs to take action to improve that. So I think a number of things come together. You know, what the world needs, what business needs to do to improve its, rep its um, reputation, what academia can do, I think, to show, a, uh, to illuminate the most effective ways of doing that, which is very much where, you know, Maurizio is, what governments can and should do to encourage and incentivize the right behavior and penalize the wrong behavior and so on. <clears throat> and I think... You know, if, if we, and I'm an optimist, I'm a glass half full merchant, David, you know, I think we can crack this and we must crack it and we will crack it, but you know, it's going to take the whole, it's just going to take the whole of my lifetime and probably well beyond that. You know, many of you may be growing old by the time this is fine, because I think this is a forever issue. You know, unlike some of the other fads that we go through, this is not a fad. This is a very, very long-term set of significant issues. And in that respect, I think it's fantastic that Imperial is going to make a big contribution to that and that we've managed to attract Maurizio and his kind of team and efforts because this is really a central issue for our society for the foreseeable future. And it's great that I think we as an institution here at Imperial, I will associate myself with Imperial for a moment, even though I have really no right to do so, having only been here 10 minutes that we are actually, you know, we are going to make a material contribution to helping people address these very complex, important issues. I think there's a very simple concept that underpins all of this, but, the, but doing it is more complex and, you know, we're going to need, we as business are going to need all the help we can get. So I think it's been, you know, a privilege to have a chance to listen to Maurizio. I think he and his team are going to make a huge contribution to this institution. This is a subject that is, you know, very close to my heart and something that, you know, I spend quite a lot of time wandering around talking to people about now because I just think that, you know, it's, it's unrelenting, I think, pressure to encourage and both encourage and require people, sometimes it's carrots, sometimes it's sticks, sometimes it's a bit of both, to actually start doing the right things. And we can solve this, you know. We can't solve it in the UK alone, but I think the power of example is tremendously important. And I think we can actually set a fantastic example for here, which hopefully will 
will influence others, including some of those bastions of climate denial. Um, I'm a realist. I don't think President Trump is going to change his, uh, his views overnight. But uh, there are many other, I think, thoughtful, well-intentioned people in the United States who are kind of more alert to these issues than perhaps he is. So I think it's a huge pleasure to propose a vote of thanks to Maurizio and to wish him and his team every success going forward. You're going to hear more from him, believe me. So please join me in a vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, John. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Thank you all for coming. It's, I mean, besides Mauricio itself, I mean, this area of sustainability and climate change is a very important strategic area for the business school and for Imperial. And so there'll be more on this, certainly, above and beyond what we're here tonight, but delightful to be, you know, welcoming you into the honor or lecture, to have your comments and to have you all. Uh, please join me in some uh, uh, reception right, at, right here, and we can continue to talk about these important matters. Thank you very much. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of the evening. Thank you.